Okay, we are in Luke chapter 4. We are in discussing the rejection of Jesus in Capernaum. Uh, so verses 14 through 29. So I'm going to read the whole account first, and then we'll pick it apart and see what, see what the Lord's telling us. Verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee. Remember, Galilee is way up north. There's Galilee, Samaria, and then Judea. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, this is Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Okay. It begins, it's right in verse 14, where it says, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Now, we talked with this before, but this is just another of those sort of difficult phrases. What does it mean he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit? Does that mean there was ever a time he didn't have the power of the Spirit? Well, no, because he's fully God and fully man at the same time. We don't know quite how that works, but he always did the Father's will. He was always, he did it perfectly. So in that sense, you would say he was always there in the power of the Spirit. But this scripture is highlighting this particular task of his, that he was doing the Father's will. He's doing his task as the Redeemer. So they're just highlighting that. But technically, there was never a time when he wasn't, didn't have the power of the Spirit. I mean, that's just not possible. Because he was God who is man. And that's always just a bit of a mystery for us, how we describe this, or how Scripture describes it. But I think that's what they want to communicate to communicate. Let's continue on. Okay, notice in verse 15, he was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. So this was that period in his life where, man, he was, you know, the, his, uh, the, uh, the people's response, he was very popular. Then he went to Nazareth. Ah, that's where he grew, that's where he was born, where he grew up, and then now he's, his family's living in Capernaum. 
But here he goes back to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, it says. And on the Sabbath day, of course, that's Friday evening to Saturday evening, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Now, remember the concept of a synagogue. Synagogue is is not really a holy place. That's the temple, the tabernacle temple. But the synagogue was where the Jews met. And the idea was, we get this from the Middle Ages, that there were, to be a synagogue, you needed 10 male Jews, 10 male Jews to have a synagogue. The idea was. And then, of course, in the synagogue, it was the seating was split. The women on one side, the men on the other. And then when they read the scripture through scrolls, when they read it, you would read it, whoever read it, read it standing up. And then, then when whoever taught, they sat down. That's kind of the, the, uh, the idea. Any qu question by Greg? Yes. I just remember reading about Hasidic Judaism, Kayim Potok, where the, I think there's a curtain down the middle. Right. Is there such a thing, or they just went no. one side or another, or who yeah, knows? Yeah, things have developed through the Middle Ages. Things, most of, of the details of what we think of as conservative or even Hasidic Judaism really emerged from the Middle Ages. We're not really talking about, so often when you talk about, let's see what the rabbis have to say about this. You're talking about rabbis from the Middle Ages. You're not talking about rabbis at 100, BC, 100 AD. No, no, no. And so that's kind of, from my point of view, that's a meaningless discussion. Meaningless discussion. So here there's nothing, obviously God doesn't give us any more detail. We do know that they split up, women on one side, men on another. And, you know, the guy who when you're reading, you know, he stood up. When he taught, you sat down. We see that reflected here. That's about it. Yeah, it's... You know, and it, we, they come in various shapes and sizes. They need at least 10. At least that's what comes out of, at least the Middle Ages, that's what comes out of it. So, okay. Now, Jesus was handed the scroll the, of the prophet Isaiah, and he unrolling it, he found the place. Now, it's not as though uh, the idea is that it wasn't as though there was a fit on a fixed Sabbath, you read this particular portion of scripture, Jesus could pick it. And he, he enrolled it to Isaiah chapter 61. He enrolled it. And then he read, of course, what we read. And now turn with me to Isaiah 61. Let's examine that. Now he, he read through 61, verse 1 through 2a, the first part of chapter 2. He didn't read the second part. He didn't read 2b. We'll, we'll, we will look at that and, and try to... We'll read... Uh, actually, we're going to read the whole chapter. Now, remember that in the book of Isaiah, you know, I've, I've beat this... You know, I've beaten you mercilessly with this sort of concept... Book of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters, those are uh, all about God's judgment on Israel and the nations that he uses to judge Israel. And then 40 to 66, it's the, everything changes positively. After he gets done judging Israel, now he's going to do something positive with them. He's going to bring them back into the land and cause them to believe. He's going to pour out these blessings. Okay, so we're in the positive side, chapter 61. And let's just read a little bit. The spirit of the, Lord, of the sovereign Lord is on me. Of course, Jesus says, this is about me. By the way, this is one of those suffering servant sections. It's all about the, the, you know, the Redeemer. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from, dark, and release from darkness for, for the prisoners. Now, stop for just a second. When, when Jesus read that in Luke 4, and then he says when he's done, he, he says, this is now fulfilled in me. This is now fulfilled. Well, the prisoners have not been set free. I mean, Rome still controls everything. But spiritually, 
through the ministry of the Messiah, yes, you're set free. Not literally. Not literally. Brian? Given the time Isaiah wrote this, would that have been understood in terms of, 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 of them being carried off and their... their <clears throat> yes. Okay, in captivity? Yes. Yep. That's how they would have understood they it. They would have that understood time. it that they're thinking in terms of whether it's the Assyrians, the Babylonians, <clears throat> boom, or the Egyptians at one point. Yes. So, in terms of dispensational theology, this would be a place where we as New Covenant theologians would point to the true fulfillment of this, not being of some future land promise where uh, Israel is established, but this is being fulfilled in Christ in the new covenant. Is, is, would that yes. be? Yeah. Especially since Jesus says, it's being fulfilled in me. And he didn't set the prisoners free in Israel under Roman rule. He didn't do that. He didn't heal everybody. But he did fulfill what this was about, but he did it spiritually, not literally. Didn't do it. Now, we wouldn't have known that if we didn't have Luke 4 telling us that. But we interpret the old through the lens of the new because what we're doing is just observing how does God interpret his own word. That's all we're doing. We're just observing. How does he do it? Okay, it's, it's one thing to say, well, no, if God you know, said that this way in Isaiah 61, that's the way it's got to be. You know, I'm saying, well, that sounds reasonable, actually, but, uh, but God doesn't agree with you. God doesn't agree with you because that's not, how, that's not how it turned out the way Jesus interpreted it. Dan? So he doesn't really quote it exactly, right? Pretty good. You got to you, you've got to you got to remember that Jesus is typically quoting the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. He's that's actually what he's quoting. He's not quoting a Hebrew text typically, but whatever. But it's be close. But why? What particular point? I should say is troubling to you. Oh, bro, we need need that mic again. Though we'd rather Dan be quiet, but the mic will make him a troublesome individual. Yeah, so it's not really troubling me as much as it's, you know, you see this a lot in the New Testament. Yes. Where they will take the Old Testament and change it a little bit and then say this fulfilled that. Okay, point out the change there. Uh, let's see. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind. Where does it say recovery of sight to the blind in the Isaiah passage? I'm not, I can't flip over on my phone as easy no, no, as I no, can. No, no, he, no, he <laughs> does, no, that, that is not there. That is not there. It is the, to set the oppressed free, yeah, that's all there. And the, the, the whole thing about the brokenhearted. Yes. Um, it's, it's just quite different. Well, really not quite different. Actually, there's only one difference. So that's actually a Septuagint. Yes. Right. That, that, that's the whole point, is that if, if, if he's quoting from the Septuagint, then that would be, uh, that's what it means. So he's kind of mixing them both. Yeah. Then. Whatever, but that's exactly what I, Isaiah 61 is all about. So they're, what they're doing, they're, they're describing a spiritual reality in physical terms. How about that? A spiritual reality in physical terms. The original context was all about physical reality, but the, but the actual fulfillment is spiritual. The actual fulfillment is spiritual. We only know that because what Jesus said in Luke 4. That's the only reason we know it. Otherwise, we would agree with dispensationalists that if we would take this at its face value if there was no qualifier. But unfortunately, there was, there is a qualifier. The words of Jesus himself. It's what we do. Okay? Let's go on. Uh, go back to Isaiah 61. He says, verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and then it stops. Jesus stopped right there. And the next part, the, to be, and the day of vengeance of our God. Of course, that's going to be when, now in this context, 
you know, you're talking about probably the Assyrians or the Babylonians coming in, wiping out, you know, the kingdom of Israel. But, of course, it would be the second coming, ultimately. But then he says, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, very positive, oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, rebuilding of the land, and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work in your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. So you will inherit a double portion in your land. And everlasting joys will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Now, in this context, you know, the Old Covenant is called an Everlasting Covenant, but of course, in this context, that's not referring to the Old Covenant, but to the New Covenant. But you would know that. You wouldn't know that otherwise. Because it's only the New Covenant that's truly everlasting, because it's spiritual, it's eternal life. The Old Covenant comes to an end at the cross. Ah. So, he's describing the glories of the New Covenant era in Old Covenant terms, which is a glorified Israel, when in reality, when in reality, the real people of God are a spiritual Israel, and they're going to be mostly going to be Gentiles, not Jews, only a little bit of Jews. Here, just to remind you, turn to Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, that those two verses that seem to be caught, caught, that seem to cause a lot of problem, where the Apostle Paul says, talking about God's plan for Israel, he says in verse 25 of Romans 11, I do not want you to be ignorant of, of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel, that is physical Israel, has experienced a hardening in part. Well, how much part? Well, 11.5 says... So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace, and if by grace, then it cannot be by works. So there's only going to be a remnant of physical Israel that are going to be saved. That's it. So it's a small group. So when it says Israel has experienced a hardening in part, well, how much hardening? The answer is complete except for a remnant. Until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Okay, so how long is, the, is only a remnant going to be saved? Well, until second coming. Because when second coming, the physical Israel, that is mostly Gentiles, they're going to come to faith in Christ. So when the remnant of the Jews come to faith in Christ and the elect of the Gentiles, which is most of the Israel of God, when they come to faith, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. That's right. That's how you'll get the Israel of God. Remnant of Jews, mostly Gentiles, you have the Israel of God. That's the idea. Unless we think that this is referring to a great number of Jews coming to faith at the end, which is a very common thing, when you get down to verses 30 to 32, which is a further explanation of what has just taken place, it describes the time frame. When will this take place? And it says, Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy, that's the Gentiles, as a result of their disobedience, that's the Jews, but notice the word now, so they too have now become disobedient, 
the Jews, in order that they too may now receive mercy as a, result, as a result of God's mercy to you. So when is this taking place? It's now. It's the new covenant era from Pentecost to the second coming. That's when this is taking place, not at the end. It's now. You just, God has provided commentary. So when will the Israel of God take place? Well, throughout the whole new covenant era, there's going to be a small amount of Jews who, whom God is going to choose, a remnant. The bulk of the people of God are going to be Gentiles. They make up the Israel of God. So he's collecting them up right now. And we get to the end, the second coming, then you'll have the Israel of God. thought this is a good, a good opportunity just to kind of review that. Yes. In Galatians 6, uh, 16, would you yes. say that he's talking about just believing national Jews, or is that referring to um, spiritual Israel? Ah. Okay, well, let's troubleshoot that. That is a good question. So let's, let's look at that. Turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. You say, it says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even, I mean, to the Israel of God. All who follow this rule. Now let's, hypothetically, let us say, maybe the Israel of God refers to Jews who become believers. Maybe. Well, the problem with that is that in chapter 4, verses 21 to 31, the allegory of Hagar and Sarah, he describes, just he says, verse 24, these things may be taken figuratively, that is, the, he says the women represent two covenants, one covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. That's the old covenant. That's Israel. And he says slaves means unbelievers. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above, heavenly Jerusalem is free, and she is our mother. Sarah represents the new covenant, which is actually the death of Jesus on the cross that purchases a people that have their sins forgiven, and they have this new heart. They're incurable God lovers. So the old covenant here produces no believers. So when you get to chapter 6, verse 16, he's, the whole point is, is that the Old Covenant only produces unbelievers. So, he, when he says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, his argument is, the Jews don't follow his rule. They're trying to be saved on the basis of works, obeying the Mosaic law. And so God purchases a new people. And as we saw in, in Romans, most of which are going to be Gentiles, Small amount, a remnant, will be Jews. And this is the Israel of God. This is it. So, it's not even, so he's already thrown Israel under the bus, as it were, in Galatians. Just like he does in Romans 9 through 11, the, a, a, as a group. Because remember, all of the evaluations of Israel from Exodus to the end are, the, are that there are no believers in Israel. Well, we know there's always a remnant. Always a remnant. Okay? I know this is review, but it's always good to go back over it. Questions? Good. Not too many questions. Okay, so let's go back to Luke 4. So Jesus is, he, he takes the scroll, he reads Isaiah 61 through 2a, and he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, because it's describing the work of the Messiah. He's going to go to the cross, he's going to purchase the people, free them up from their sin, that's what he's going to do. And then, of course, the folks respond negatively, because he's taking this claim upon himself, and when it says, isn't this Joseph's son, that's probably not a positive statement. Because they're trying to sort of break, cut him down to size. He's making these claims that are a little too glorious. 
And then Jesus quotes in verse 23, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what you, we have heard that you did in Capernaum, that is, miracles. But elsewhere he tells us that he did very few miracles in Nazareth because they, they couldn't believe. They didn't believe in him. Now, that's interesting. That's another issue. We're not going to spend our time so much going in that. But the bottom line is there was so much unbelief in Nazareth that he's not even going to do hardly any miracles. Nope. Not going to do it. It's interesting that on one hand you would say, well, the whole purpose of these miracles are to authenticate who he is. And now he's sort of... He just, he's making it even more difficult on the Jews in Nazareth. Well, that's because it's not God's plan to save them. Brian. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because, I mean, it does say that they were speaking well of him. Up to that point, yeah. You know, and, 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 and the gracious words, but they're going, how could, it, I think they're, how could this be? Isn't this Joseph's son? Yeah. Now, with that said, let me ask you, I mean, at this point, Jesus presses this point. I mean, he calls them out. Yes. And to your point, um, what does that say in terms of us and our witness in society today? I mean, <clears throat> confronting people when they're in their sin. I mean, it's, it's not as if they were being, I don't think they were necessarily being provocative and saying, this is Jesus, you know. May not, may and, not. But yet he sure called and read their mail. I mean, yeah, uh, he, he did respond. Is, is, there something, is there something there that we can take from that in terms of how yeah. we ought to respond in society today? We, well, you, we certainly well, don't like calling people out and calling no, things no, we what don't. they are. No, and we're told to, to do it in a kind way. That is true. So we don't really take the prophet's stance. You know, we don't do that. But th this brings up the issue, which is seems to be brought up in, 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 uh, often at least, is that, well, I want to be careful that I don't rub the unbeliever the wrong way. My answer is, that's, that is something that's out of your hands. That is simply the response of a God-hating heart to the truth. You can't control that. All you can do is make sure that you're doing it in a loving fashion. And if they respond really negatively and get emotional, that is really not your fault. They are, they are responding, as, as Brian put up, described to us earlier that you know, they, are, they, they have been suppressing the truth. And now you're reminding them of what is true, but in their hatred toward God, they don't want to give up their position. So, of course, this is, this is emotional fireworks. It can well be. And you know that, especially if it's in your family. People get just bent out of shape over that. But you've got to understand, that's part of the Christian life. And if you buy into this idea that any conflict is necessarily bad, you are not going to be faithful as a believer. Now, and admittedly, we're saying you don't want to be the cause of the conflict because of the way you handled it. That's true. We can control that. But conflict is a part of the Christian life. It is, a, it is a part of it. You have to just embrace it, and you have to learn how to handle it. But you cannot run away from it. You cannot seek to avoid it. That is, that is not possible and be biblically faithful. And that is a problem in the church in our day. That is a problem. And so... You know, the idea of you sharing your faith and your family blows up in front of you. Well, what did you expect? I mean, Jesus, who did it perfectly. Everything he did was perfect. Man, they're, kind of, they're blowing up. They're, they want to kill him. Take him to the cliff. Now, it's interesting of the two illustrations from the Old Testament that he brought into them. If you turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings 17, yeah, this is that, uh, it's a fascinating account. God is going to, he's bringing judgment on Israel, the nor northern kingdom, Elijah's the prophet. I'll paraphrase part of this. 
And the Lord, you know, uh, is going to bring, you know, a, you know, no rain. And so famine comes on the land. The Lord is taking care of Elijah. The, he's causing the ravens to uh, feed him. It says in verse 2, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. A little miraculous, but hey, just seems like it's a normal thing. Sometimes later, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, that's outside Israel, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called and said, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I, ha I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home, do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, quote, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away, did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up. The jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Now, why does uh, Jesus quote this? Well, the point is, is that his immediate audience, the Jews, think they, are, they are, have this special relationship with God. Now, they did have a special status with God. That is true, because they're the, the picture of the people of God. And as the picture, they did have special status uh, as a nation. But salvation wasn't part of it. And so now he's saying that, you know, with Elijah, God wasn't interested. He didn't go to, you know, a widow in Israel. He went to someone in Zarephath, in Sidon, and, you know, to provide for Elijah. He just, he's ignoring Israel. And then he's going to go on to talk about our time is going by. He's going to talking about Naaman, the Syrian, I mean, they were doing, bringing war on Israel. And Naaman had leprosy, and he found out that he needs to go see Elisha, the prophet, to get healed. He goes to Elisha, the prophet, he does get healed. It's a fascinating account. But God wasn't healing Israelites from leprosy at the time. He wasn't doing it. People were living and dying of leprosy. But he's going to heal a Syrian who was bringing war against Israel. And of course, now this doesn't say this. But of course, when all is said and done, the real people of God are mostly not Jews. They're not going to be Jews. You know, all of that history, let's say from 1400 B.C., which is Mount Sinai, you know, to the time of Jesus, approximately around 1,500 years. Bulk of our Bible, as far as pages, just a picture. Israel gets rejected. They get replaced in God's plan with the spiritual Israel, which is mostly Gentile, little bit of Jew. Jay? Yeah, I love the picture here, just of Israel, you know, um, because they represent all of us. You know, if we were given every opportunity, we'd still reject God. Yep. Um, so you'd think, you know, an ancient Israelite, you'd, if you met him, he'd be like, hey, uh, if you're not aware, we're a pretty big deal. I mean, in the world, 
as compared to all of humanity, we're a pretty big deal. And here, Jesus comes, and they're happy with him because he's doing miracles. So his reputation precedes him. Then they're happy when he reads from the scroll, even though they don't probably don't understand why, how this is fulfilled in his name. And then when he finally pushes and basically lets them know you're not that important, like God's more important than you are, that's when they, they rage on him. So as long as they're feeling important, they were fine. And as soon as, you know, Jesus drilled down that there's something bigger than them, that's when they, yeah, you know, was that we're angry. Now, before we go, the very end, when they went to throw him off the cliff, they, and they, they got him to the cliff. Then all it says, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. What do we, what's the takeaway? Well, obviously, it was not God's plan for him to be thrown off the cliff. I mean, it's very simple. But for you and for me, a good reminder that your life is un, uh, under the control of your father, father in heaven. And that nothing is going to happen prematurely to his plan. Nothing. Our job is to be faithful. And, you know, as, as we, we say at times, you are immortal until God is done with you. We are. We are immortal until he's done with us. You will have your memory as long as he wants you to have your memory. When he's going to take it away, he takes it away. You know, when Priscilla had her last couple weeks of, you know, being lucid, her last week she wasn't, but she was listening to Elizabeth Elliot constantly in bed. Her, she, Elizabeth Elliot had, had, had been, was now dead, but all her, um, her talks were being played, and they're very edifying, very encouraging. And, and so Scylla was just, she ministered to Priscilla all constantly. And she would lay in bed just miserable, but she would listen to this and just encouraging her to, you know, be faithful to the end. Okay, that's great. But you know what happened to Elizabeth Elliot? Yeah, Alzheimer's. And it wasn't just one bad year. It was a, it was a number of years. She, she lost it. And from a human point of view, you're thinking, what's the sense of that? She was a godly woman, a biblically grounded woman who was gifted in communicating. And the Lord just had her, you know, had to be, having to be cared for because she was losing her mind. She lost her mind. This is how the Father treats those whom he loves. I mean, this is where the rubber does meet the road. And we don't know what he wants to bring out of our lives. None of us know that. And it's none of our business, actually. You know, if you're like Jonathan Edwards, the great theologian of the colonial era, he had more influence dead than alive. You know? You don't think about it in those terms. You know, your ministry is going to be really good once you're dead. It's so-so right now, but it's going to be fantastic after you die. So you die. So you die. You get better. Okay, well, that's, that's the way the Lord did it with him, you know? And so here we just see the Lord's absolute control. Jesus was not the time, and we're, we're not given any big explanation. He just, he just turns and he walks right through. There's no way they could have stopped him because it was not God's plan. And that's very encouraging for all of us. No one can do anything. You know, as Jan has brought out, President Biden, we should pray for him and, you know, the heads of Congress and everybody. But the, but the by end of the day, he cannot do anything that's not part of the plan of this holy God who is our father. Can't do anything. And that is encouraging. So we are not the people who just sort of wring our hands. Oh, so difficult days. No. No, we are privileged to be living in this particular time. And it has unique challenges, but opportunities to be faithful. So let's pray. Father, thank you 
that as we see just the unfolding of your plan in Jesus' life, as he seeks to ultimately end up at the cross to save the people from their sin, whatever you do is right. You do surprises, even as we look at the life of your son. But you make no mistakes. Thank you that we as your children, we have the privilege of being in your family. And you guarantee that it's not possible for anything to come into our lives that is motivated by your love for us. So thank you for teaching us from your word. Thank you for the, just the amazing privilege of living in the time of fulfillment, the new covenant era. Just help us to be faithful. Just use, use our lives for you any way you see fit. And we do love you. Amen.